Hi, everybody. I'm Ava Chen. I am a research assistant in the Shamble Lab at Harvard, and we study jumping spiders. And so the topic of this talk is how jumping spiders talk, or how jumping spiders jump, and or why a roboticist thinks jumping spiders and evolutionary biology is really cool. So what are jumping spiders? Um, if anyone is familiar with the recent YouTube sensation, Lucas the jumping spider, this is Lucas. He's a jumping spider. Uh, jumping spiders are a family of spiders that are nothing like Charlotte's Web. They don't make webs. They don't hang out and wait for flies to run into them. Instead, they are active hunters. They run around. They pounce on little bugs. And they sort of use jumping as a normal mode of locomotion. They get from one place to another as readily as humans just jump. They feel like it. Um, so uh, we talked about bandwidth, and 70% of the internet is video. I have lots of videos. So jumping spiders have really good vision, have really good cognitive abilities, and they actively seek out prey. In this case, he's found an ant, and he is looking at it, and the ant has absolutely no idea what's going to happen, and he jumps really quick, and he pounces on them. And jumping spiders are all over the place, on every continent except Antarctica, and maybe sometimes when they run around on boats. Um, they navigate a 3D world. So there's going to be a jumping spider on this wall. He's going to jump onto the leaf and then navigate. And this is just what they do as a daily course of, of life. And they're really tiny. They're like five millimeters long. Um, so how do they actually navigate places in an efficient manner? Um, so in the lab, we found that jumping spiders uh, very rarely miss. They're very repeatable. They explore their world. And when they see a gap like this, this is a two centimeter gap, so the spider gives you a sense of scale. When they find a space and they realize that they've explored all there is to see, and they see that there's some distance between them, they'll, they'll go to it. So it means that in the lab, we can set up things like high speed cameras and do experiments on spiders. And so what we're trying to do in the lab is study um, a bit of how spiders move and therefore what their behavior is. So this is a high-speed video. This entire jump takes place in uh, 50, 50 milliseconds. So that's half the time it takes for you to plank. Um, these spiders go really quickly also. Uh, so framing how spiders jump, I'm going to sort of step through it and then explain to you how they jump. So first, they, they launch. Actually, they launch using a hydraulic mechanism. Um, oh, no. And this, at this point of takeoff, and what they do is they, before they jump, they always anchor a piece of silk behind them as a drag line. And this serves several functions, we think. Um, one of them is sort of obvious. When you're exploring a world that's sort of unknown, uh, you don't want the sort of lost opportunity if you happen to fall, which they rarely do. But if you happen to fall, then they're very small. They won't die. But it would be a big pain to get back up to where you'd like to go and then try again. But if you had a drag line, then you can just climb up your tether, try again, and there's no real loss here. Another thing that they do with their silk that we found out is they actually um, use it as a, like almost a tethered, a tethered jump. So they can redirect their trajectory of their jump in midair using the silk. So in this case, it's breaking. And you can sort of see the counter rotation as it comes back down as it's using the silk to, to decelerate. So then they land. I mentioned that they jump with fluid pressure. So spiders use a hydraulic mechanism. Uh, their analogy to our blood is called hemolymph. And spiders have two segments. They have a head segment and they have an abdomen. And Sort of, if you imagine their two segments like so, their head is actually where their legs are attached. And their head section has an exoskeleton. And you can imagine that their head is like a hamburger. You have the top part of their body, you have the bottom part of their body, and their legs bet are between the two segments like the lettuce in a hamburger. So what they do is they take the hemolymph and they pressurize their heads. Their brains are also in their heads, so it's sort of wild how they get pressurized brains. But that's an aside. They, they 
pressurize their heads, and then they really quickly squash their two segments together, and that is how they elongate their legs and get the speeds that we see. But what we found when we were watching these high-speed videos and comparing their trajectories is, OK, so you have this cannon. Somehow you've gotten this pressurized um, initial velocity. But the spiders don't follow sort of the sort of standard projectile motion that you see, even accounting the air resistance in the room. Um, if you compare what you'd guess at you have your angle that we see and you have your initial velocities, their actual trajectory is slightly different. So we think that the spiders are using the silk to modify their flight trajectory. And what we'd like to know is how much control do the spiders have over their silk, and therefore, how much control do they have over their flight midair? Is it simply like you aimed, you fired, and then you go through this reflexive motion every time, and that's how spiders jump? Or are they somehow timing the yanking on their silk mid-flight with some amount of volitional control to change their trajectory. And if either of these, that's, that's one really cool. That says a lot about their cognitive abilities and their pathfinding abilities. And if the second, then their reaction speeds must be wild. And that is sort of a cognitive function that, well, spiders must be really smart. And that'd be really cool to emulate in things that we'd like to make. We also have the alternative hypothesis that we need to disprove first. And that's, well, Possibly that the flight that we see is just because silk is stretchy and it has mechanical properties and the spiders actually have no control over it. It's just the way it is. So how, how do we figure that out? Uh, this particular roboticist uh, wants to apply rigid body dynamics to a spider. Um, we can take a spider and say that it has two segments. It has a head, it has an abdomen, and it has a pivot point between these two segments. And we can say that, OK, so when we look at the videos of these spiders, we can say that there's a center of mass, and we have two relative orientations of the spider segments. And so once the spider has left the ground, um, especially in the still air of our lab, we can sort of apply a model that says we have silk force, and we can say there's silk force with time. So sometimes it appears, sometimes it doesn't. We have air resistance that is proportional to velocity. And let's just say these are all the forces that are present. We can sort of take a nod from inverse dynamics, from robotics, and apply this model. And then we can simulate what forces must have been present in the spider's jump. So, so what we've done is a bunch of simulations with our abdomen, our head. We can guess at how much air resistance must have been present. And then F equals MA if you have enough information about the accelerations and enough information about the mass properties of a spider, then you can back out what forces were present and therefore what forces must have come from silk. So we can do things like overplay them with the video. We say that how spiders use silk is um, you have a bunch of silk activity at the beginning. Then you have some amount of time when there's not that much silk activity. And then you have a lot at the end. And so the bottom graph sort of is just the magenta, just the silk. With over time, you have a period of lots, a period of not very much, and more at the end. So we combine that with um, uh, sort of animal behavior experiments. And we say, what happens if we start moving stuff with our platforms? What happens if we start disturbing the spider jumps? So in this case, we have uh, one platform that can accelerate really quickly. And this one is going to zoom backwards. And our hypothesis was, well, if the spiders have no idea what's happening, maybe, they will jump. They'll try to yank on the silk. The platform that the silk is attached to will zoom really fast backwards. And maybe the spider will just cartwheel into space. And what we see is uh, the spider still lands. But what we also see is when we look at what forces were present from the accelerations, that it's much higher in comparison to this one. Um, we also see that our particular platform uh, wobbled a bit at sort of this point of the jump. So we induced some slack, and that had an interesting pattern 
in how the spider jumped. But what we also saw was that spiders stick the landing in spite of whipping the platform back and forth. Um, so this one was a stationary case that we saw. This is the same spider, by the way. And that one was the anti one. And so over a two centimeter gap, which is twice the body length of a spider. Now think about that when you're jumping. Uh, the spider still manages to get from one place to another and is relatively unperturbed. So back to the slack. We thought, OK, well, if we think that the spiders are using silk tension to uh, change their trajectory, if we think that it's essential to their jumping, what happens if we force the spider to not have control over its silk line? What happens if, for some period of time, it has no control over its <coughs> jump? Um, will it start cartwheeling? Will it do something else? And so we sent the platform zooming forwards. And we were doing these experiments in parallel with the simulation. So when we found that there was a period of using the silk at the beginning, and a period of using the silk at the end, we also found that, well, maybe what's happening is when we send the platform forwards is we're missing the time that it would be trying to utilize the silk. Um, which uh, is still research currently ongoing. Actually, this experiment was like a week ago. So it's very exciting to us. But the idea is if we apply sort of physics simulations, we can also inform um, in vivo experiments. And so uh, experimental biology and uh, robotics working together. So this is really ongoing research. We've done one spider and a few jumps. And the hope is that if we have defined a um, physics model that would work with, or that still holds for our 10 spiders and 150 jumps, then maybe we'll have a good idea of how spiders jump. All right, so I'd like to thank, this work is done uh, in the Shamble Lab when we were with the Bauer Fellows at um, John Harvard Distinguished Science Fellows at Harvard, and of course, CE. And RSI. I do have one blooper video. We've run around 150 jumps, and this is one of the very few where we ran some slack, and then the spider uh, doesn't quite make it. <laughs> I'll take your questions. Is the, con is the feedback control done from actually proprioception on the silk or vision, or do you have any ideas of where that? What it's using? We were, we were, this was motivated, that's what motivated all the slack experiments. At first we thought that the silk was performing some kind of odometer. So we thought that, well, what happens if we send the platform moving backwards? The silk, more silk gets drawn, think like a hot glue gun. The spider maybe thinks it's going way too fast. Maybe it will start yanking on the brakes early. And we found that that's not necessarily so. Um, then we thought that, well, spiders are, have very good vision systems. Um, maybe sort of the way that humans do, they sort of override certain sensations of, of acceleration with informant with vision. And so we're currently working on that as well. It might be think, both. Think it might be... I think it might be vision. Okay. Yeah. What happens if you puff on the spider mid-jump with a little blast of air? Because I noticed that the air resistance term is in there too. Would yes. that yeah, um, tell you about um, Yes, uh, we are, that's a good thought. Last time I gave this talk, which was like two weeks ago, uh, someone gave us this idea. Uh, we're trying to keep our experiments to sort of plausible things that would happen in the environment, especially if an animal model is sort of not very useful to ask them to do something that they would have no experience with. But, but I mean, exactly, so. The same way that a leaf, like in the video, the leaf moved, that was like the yeah. puffer moving, and the leaf could also move. So I guess in, in that case, well, if it were a more rigid surface, like a branch, I mean, breeze is blown, that's a thing. Yeah, so I was going to follow up with that's exactly what we hope to do next. Um, we hope to add in some air resistance to sort of emulate sort of other disturbances that could happen in the environment. And we're also messing around with um, sort of the friction coefficient of the surfaces, because that would be also be something that they might encounter and might have some idea to deal with. Yes. I feel like that would be especially visually driven, especially the friction of the landing surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does 
you pack so much vision into such a tiny brain? We would like to know. Do we <laughs> <laughs> particularly, I'm particularly interested because as a roboticist, our, our grasping robots are not as good as the biological models, and our vision robotics are not as good as the biological models. So we'd like to know. Uh, there's some really interesting about spider vision, uh, notably how they get depth perception with sort of m possibly monocular vision. Uh, they have, I think a good third of their brain, however, is devoted to just vision. So that's sort of how they pack it in. They, they think about it a lot. <laughs> Uh, I think Rebecca was next. Uh, yes. Is, are there things that they can't handle? Like if the landing platform moves up and down or a specific distance, where are the limits? Do you know? Um, so or any guesses? In, so in the, in the wild, they are very discerning about choosing where they would go based on what they're trying to achieve and how they want to explore. For example, if you put them in a path such that they can observe, but the only way to get from point A to point B is actually to like walk behind them, walk on top of the thing, walk on a catwalk, and then jump, as opposed to like just trying to get there. They know that the correct way to go is like very indirect. And we're trying to figure out how much of that pre-planning um, is based on sort of a mental model of their own capabilities, mm -hmm. or whether it's very instinctual. Um, we're trying to figure that out. This is all very exciting. It's all very new. Yeah. Um, it'd be interesting to know the effect of a headwind or a tailwind if, if that adjusts their jump. Yeah, so that calls into sort of the same idea of air resistance. Um, I suspect that they, to sort of all realistic ways of how they experience life outside, they'd be able to deal with it. Um, it's sort of unclear how much of their jumping capabilities are learned versus instinctual. Um, for example, one thing that we'd like to start doing is start moving the landing platform and figuring out if they can adjust mid-air or and what their reaction speed in that, in that sense is. Uh, we don't know. I suspect that they do just fine, though. They, they seem to, it, it's an exercise in frustration where they seem to succeed at every jump that we hand them. <laughs> so normally, when you're setting up an experiment, you'd like them to be able to fail at something, and it, it's been hard. <laughs> So you were talking about the hydraulic process at launch, and I was wondering, um, does, is there any sort of fluid redistribution that's going on in flight at all? That's very hard. Um, yeah. The reason why we know enough about their hydraulic mechanism at launch is a lot of work from Perry and Brown in 1959. That's where most of the observational thing, that was on the total slide. Uh, and what they did was sort of, um, I, they had a whole array of pressure sensors, I think. And uh, we, we hope to be able to do something along the lines of using thermal cameras and something like that to figure out what the distribution pressure is mid-flight. But you can't exactly take apart a spider <laughs> mid-jump. And you can't like take an, a component out. It, bi biology is difficult in that way. We, we'd like to know. <laughs>